Amen. You can be seated. So you guys enlisting today? All right, man. We're part of that army God's raising up. And, you know, I say when you're coming here on Sundays, this, this isn't church, right? I mean, this is just a building. It's a church. When you walk through the door, you're the church. And when you leave here, the church goes. And so you take the church to work and you take the church to school and you take the church back to your house because you are the church. And so when we come together on Sundays, what we're about is we're about learning and growing and strengthening our Monday afternoon walk with Jesus, our Wednesday evening, our Friday night walk with Jesus. So we're going to gain insight today to apply to our lives so that we can live every day and be the church because that's what God has called calling us to do. And we're right in the middle of a series in our preparation for Easter called Via Dolorosa. And what we're looking at is kind of that way of suffering that Jesus went on his way to Golgotha, on his way of laying his life down on the cross at Calvary. And, you know, I'm so excited about what God has been doing inside of this faith community over the last eight years. And there's nothing that gets me more excited but to see God begin to move in the lives of people, begin to put a word on their heart to share with the congregation, begin to speak to them. And I love especially when I'm able to see this next generation rise up with a word from the Lord for Wickenburg, Arizona. It's the place that I know and I love so much and it really excites me. And so I'm excited to introduce today my favorite next generation pastor of the house, right? He may just want to be called a speaker, but as he's going to share his heart and share his, his passion with you, he's going to help pastor this congregation and lead us closer in the throne room of Jesus. Will you guys give it up for my close friend, Mr. Austin Smith. It gets better, doesn't it? Can we hear me all right? Yes. Yes. I said, can we hear me all right? Yes. Man, it's 1030 service. You guys should already be awake. Well, good morning, everyone. If you don't know me, my name is Austin Smith, and I'm so thankful that you're here today, and I'm glad that you showed up on this day so I could share a very important message to me. And it's weird how it all happened that, you know, Via De La Rosa, talking about, Pastor Greg just mentioned, you know, the walkway that which Jesus took to the cross. And I think that the last few weeks when this, God was laying this on my heart, couldn't have happened at a, at a better time, I think. So you might ask yourself, what is... The word peace oh, no, is... Hang common. on just a second. We're going to talk about what is peace to us. Well, there's a literal definition of peace, a worldly view of peace. And then we also have the biblical context of peace. The worldly literal view of peace or definition of peace is freedom from disturbance. So that's something where we can go and run away to, get away from something, to not feel a certain type of pain. That's freedom of disturbance, running away from a situation, removing ourselves from something that is painful. That is freedom of disturbance. To me, we all have our own definitions of peace. My definition of peace is I'm a big hunter and fisher. I love to go get my boat out early in the morning, and as soon as the, the sun is crescenting over the mountains and, and the water is just like glass and I can fire up my boat and take across it, that's very peaceful to me. I love that. I also love riding my horses really early in the morning before the sun comes up. That's peaceful to me. I love gathering cows, like wait towards the evening when the sun's going down. That's very peaceful to me. Even when I'm fishing or when I'm hunting, that's all peaceful to me. But it's, peace is not a destination, a place that we can go to. Peace is a state of mind and a state of our heart and a state of our soul. That's interesting, is it? When we think of peace in biblical terms, we always thought about getting away from conflict and from, from war and triumph. That's a lot about in the Old Testament, but the New Testament, it talks about Jesus being shalom, him being that peace. So I'm going to jump right in here to Isaiah 26, verse 3. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one right in front of you. If you didn't bring one with you, you go ahead and use that one. You can take that Bible home. It's a gift from the place to you, but let's read this together. It says, Isaiah 26, verse 3. It says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast. And I had to do a lot of studying to understand this. But it says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast. And what that means is that God is telling us, is like, there's never going to be, you know, there's not going to be not chaos and strife and hurt and pain and trials and tribulations in our life. But we can know perfect peace even in those types of turmoil and that pain and that suffering. We can know that perfect peace. And Isaiah was prophesying about a, the, the, the coming of a king that would bring that type of peace to us. And that's who he's talking about, is Jesus being the prince of peace coming here. 
And I think also I wanted to, so, you know, in order to find that perfect peace, our mind and our heart and our eyes have to be steady and stable. But they, in order for them to be in that type of place, they have to be fixated on God. Because we try to put our, ourselves in situations where we can get around that chaos and that pain and that hurt and run to these perfect places of peace. But you can't when your eyes and your heart is not fixated on God first. In order to get to those types of places, you have to be fixated here and here first rather than fixated on what's going on in front of you. Amen? And we're going to jump into Colossians next. So this is where the sermon's going to start getting hot, okay? So Colossians 3.15, it says here, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. So what does peace have to do with, you know, uh, Via Dolorosa, the walkway and the pathway through Jesus? Well, Paul is telling us here that letting Christ be the referee or the umpire of our hearts. How many sports fans do we have in here? Yeah, yeah. We got some, okay. Any basketball, football, baseball fans, any, any type of sport that requires some type of judge or someone to step in and, and make a decision on what happens. Um, you know, I'm a diehard Dallas Cowboys fan, and we play three teams on Sunday. The opposing team, the referees, and the rest of the country. So I, uh, <laughs> so I have, you know, we play against three different types of referees, but, but Paul is telling us that's how Christ needs to be with our hearts. And if you understand competitive sports, you know that um, a referee can make an entirely huge difference in the outcome of a game, the momentum of a game, the whole attitude of a team on the game. That's how our hearts are when it comes to the situation. 90% of what, how we, uh, what happens to us is how we react to a situation, rather than that 10% of is actually what happens to us. So Paul is telling us here to let Christ be the referee and the umpire of our hearts. And why does he want us to be, the, to be that deciding factor, that judge? Because in our hearts are completely different things. They're very complex. That video talks about our life is complex, so our hearts are complex. So love, jealousy, trust, dishonesty, honesty, desires, hopes, fears, those are all things that combine into our heart and things that we, can, that we clash with over time. And, and especially within our walk, in our faith, our, fa our, faith, uh, our faith walk. And Paul is just explaining to us that we must decide whether to choose the conflicting element of our heart or a peaceful element of our heart. And what I mean by that is, is that in these type of situations, when you're in an argument with someone, when you're having a disagreement, when something terrible has happened, when your heart and you're depressed or you're hurting, we can choose to either let Christ be the center of our hearts and to surrender to him rather than to surrender to those circumstances which have been laid before us. I know it's so much easier for us to take a step or to... to lash out and be upset and frustrated rather than to turn to God in these types of hurt and these pains. I know, I think everyone here can say that someone has said something mean, hateful to them, or has done something in that manner to them that really, you know, put them to an edge of the point where they lashed out against them and they turned away from God. I'm guilty of that. And I would be lying if I said I didn't. Because it's so much easier to have that knee-jerk reaction very quickly when someone does something bad to you or when something terrible happens to you rather than to turn to God and say, I'm going to surrender to your plan and your presence in my life and let you be the peace referee of my heart. Because the tongue is a weapon. We're going to talk about that even more today. It says that the tongue is a weapon because Jesus did not come to earth just to give peace, but he came to make us peacemakers. And what I mean by that, and what he means by that is that he didn't just come to, you know, save us from, the, he came to, to save those who are hurting, to help those that have been manipulated and abused and those that are crying out for someone to rescue them. Jesus not just wasn't only just a peaceful man, he also set a precedence on what it was like to be a peacemaker. He went into the temple and he flipped the tables of the, of, of the priests and everyone that was there because they were abusing and, and manipulating the Gentiles. He wasn't a violent man, but he set the precedence of what it's like to be a peacemaker. Blessed are those who are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Jesus, by doing that, he wasn't being violent, but he was letting everybody know that I am here to, to defend the hurt and the oppressed and the men manipulated and those that need help. That's what I am here for. And it says here that, you know, he wasn't telling you not to be um, passive. He was telling you to be proactive in these types of situations. And it says, be, and be thankful. When we're called to be peacemakers, it's hard to step into that next realm of being peacemakers. Pastor Greg mentioned a few weeks or but two months ago I preached about, you know, being all in. What should I do? How, God, how do I live like this instead of like this? And being all in. And sometimes being a peacemaker, that is a calling that we've all been given. But it's hard to understand and, and realize when God is giving us that call in our life. And to be thankful for that. 
And I think of back at the time when I was a younger kid, my parents had um, two air conditioning companies, and they worked extremely hard to buy both of these companies. And this is when my brother and I were growing up. We were both very young. We were young enough to remember these type of things, but weren't just young or old enough to comprehend what was going on. But we were attending a church at the time, and, and the Holy Spirit was moving, and I was on fire for God, and, and I could see within the realm around me and the community realm around me that God was working and moving in our life. And he was actually preparing us for a journey that we were getting ready to go on. And at the time, so the economy tanked. We lost both of our, the, my parents lost their businesses and they went uh, bankrupt. And I remember sitting down on the couch in front of my dad and he said, son, before, as, as God is my witness, you boys will always have a house, you will have food and you will have clothing. Uh, for the rest of your life, as long as you live under mine, I will take care of you boys. And he said, we have $3 in our bank account. And I'll never forget that. Because then we moved into my uncle's uh, property, and um, my parents lived in their travel trailer. My brother and I were fortunate enough to live in my uncle's house and, and had our own two rooms. And um, thank God that my grandfather had actually given me my first pickup two years before that, a 1993 Ford F-150. It wasn't pretty, but she was mine, so it didn't matter. But, but it was all beat up and rusted, and it wasn't pretty, but it was mine. And, and, God, bless, and God showed his grace over my family because of that. And following that, I didn't mention this in the second service, but I know my father had preached this from the pulpit before, but my mother got a job at Grand Canyon University. And one of the benefits there is if one of your spouses or your kids can go tuition free. And that was God showing his grace over my life. And that was me showing I need to be thankful for him. Let, even though that what was going on was, was terrible and, and we were hurting and we were pain and it had a lot of pain going on in our life, but letting Christ be the center of our heart, being called to be peacemakers and being thankful Taking, take an inventory for what you have and what you don't have. You know, we had all kinds of things. I had dozens of horses. I had quads, dirt bikes, boats, all, and anything that a young kid that's a redneck that likes to run around and get, and get you know, make mud and make a lot of trouble, I had it all. And that was interesting growing up that, you know, you'd realize that those things aren't the, what's most important. And to be thankful for what's around you and be thankful for the presence and the, and the journey that God is bringing you on, that we're here to walk stronger in our faith every day rather than to accumulate things over time. There's nothing wrong with having a bunch of things, but being thankful for what is in front of you, what has God has given to you at the moment, because you can have it all and you can have nothing. And, where you're, and what matters is where your heart's at with Jesus. Amen? Amen. When we're thankful, we can, be, we can worship wholeheartedly. And being grateful opens our hearts to God's peace. It allows us to surrender to God's plan for our life. In the book of Peter, it says here, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, when I looked into this earlier, it was telling me that carrying our worries and our stress and the pain of the past is showing that we have yet to fully trust God. And when we have yet to fully trust God, we continue to remove ourselves from God's presence. We continue to restrict ourselves from surrendering to his presence in our life. We, can, we, we, confuse, we can sometimes confuse that by being aware of these type of things, being aware of our foolishness and our sin, that it is not somehow God's problem. Well, it is God's problem now because you're aware of it. And it is up to you to surrender to God now because he's aware of what's being laid on your heart. Remember how I said that your heart is complex and everything that is clashing there together? That is understanding that God is stirring up something inside of you and he's asking you to surrender to me, to cast your yoke upon me. This here says, you know, admitting that those needs is showing that you're, you have the humility to do that. And that video talked about knowing that peace is being humility, having that humility. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I have a story. There's a friend of mine, she, when she was in high school, she lost two of her really good friends in a tragic car accident. And I could relate to that because I have lost family and friends like that. In high school, I lost a couple friends that way. And I, when I was younger, my, I was about seven months old. My dad's dad died in a drunk, uh, drunk driving accident. So accidents were pretty prone to my family, I understand. And I had a cousin, and when I was a senior in high school, he died in a head-on collision on the I-10. So they were pretty, well, a sore wound to my family. And so when she told me about her story, you know, I'd watched my dad struggle with that car accident stuff. I watched my mother struggle with it. I struggled with it. But when I talked to my friend about it, 
And she said, you know, I lost my two friends and there was two things that I could have done. I could have succumbed to my circumstance that had happened there or I could turn to God and say, Jesus, I need to surrender to you. I need your peace in my life to understand this, to find your peace and to be in your presence to cure my heart. And she said, and I, and I, and I had a, an epiphany moment like, well, why don't we do that with everything? Why does it just have to be in the hurting, painful things in our life? Why can't it just be in the small, tiny things that hurt us? When, you know, we hit a red light, say, Jesus, I need your peace right now. I can't deal with this. I need your peace right now. That's something that I tried to do. Why shouldn't we do that with the, with the big things and the small things in our life? And to be open to those type of things. And it talks about here, you know, the enemy, de the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. At this church, we talk about the enemy comes to, you know, in the, in the scripture, but we press on it here a lot because we are aware of other forces that are trying to be against us. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We're going to go steal, kill, and destroy. Everybody on the ready. The enemy comes to steal, kill, destroy. All right, that was a little weak on that side. Let's try one more time. The enemy comes to steal, kill, destroy. Destroy. Okay, now we're all awake. But anyway, says, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The enemy is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. The lion is representing the enemy in this type of situation. If you know what a lion does, a lion does not attack healthy, strong, and vibrant animals and those that are surrounded by many others. It doesn't go and attack a herd of hippos or a, hippo, or a, a group of, of elephants or gazelles because it looks for the sick and the tired and the weak and those that are all alone and secluded off from the rest of each other. That's what the enemy does to you when, he's, when you have secluded yourself off from God's children and God's family. When you were in a place of hurt and pain and destruction, carrying that burden and that weight on upon yourself, and you have been removed from God's, from God's family, that's when the enemy looks for you. And it is hard to be ready for that type of situation because it's unaware and it's unexpected to you. Because remember when I talked about my friend, she could have either succumbed to her circumstance or she could turn to God and for him to be there for her. And she chose to be there with her, to be with God and the enemy was nowhere to be found. For the longest time, this is my testimony, for the longest time I struggled with lying when growing up. I don't know what it was. The devil just had a, a, a stranglehold on me and I could not seem to get rid of it. For some reason, it turned people away from me that, that cared about me. It broke, prom it broke relationships that had not, had not been healed and it drew people too closer to me that were not good influences in my life. I'm only 23 years old and there were some people in my life that, I had, that, that had an influence over me because I had removed myself from God's kingdom and God's, and God's family because of my sin and my hurtfulness and my pain. And I thought, God is not going to do anything about this. But I had to understand that in that time, in that situation, I needed to turn to God and repent for what I had done for him to carry that burden and that weight on me instead of me continually carrying it and thinking I'm going to get through it. When we talk about peace, we say that, you know, it's not a place or a destination, but we sure try to think it is. We go to self-help classes, we read self-help books, we try to go on, on vacations, we try to go to these certain situ situations, we try to go halfway around the world to some, you know, psychiatrist to find that perfect peace, but it's been here all along. We don't have to go very far for it. Everybody's going to hear about the kingdom of God someday, and it's right here. To find that peace is right here in front of us. If it sits next to you on your bedside, that peace is right here. And these time in these dire times when it feels like the world's going towards Armageddon and your heart hurts and your mind is, is all over in different places, peace is right next to your bedside. It's here. Jesus said, you know, when he talked about flipping over the tables in the temples, he had mentioned that, you know, he came here to help the people that are oppressed and to, and to fight for those that cannot fight for themselves. And in the video talks about it. he calls for us to be peacemakers and to fight, not to be violent, but to fight off the wards of evil spirits. And that sword, Jesus said, I have brought a sword with me. And he wants you to use that. He has given you that sword to speak life over yourself, life over others around you, for young men to speak life over your future bride, for young women to speak life over your future husband and your children together, to speak life over your family and friends who are hurting, or to speak life over your future, to cast out the, princes of, the prince of darkness, to encompass yourself in peace, to surrender to God's presence. That is what being proactive to finding what peace is like. When you're hurting and you're in a place of state where you cannot get your mind right and you need to find that peace of God, come to the church. Come to God's people. Come, to, come speak to them. Surround yourself with those who are ready to fight and battle with you. Don't leave yourself out there. I know because I'm a redneck, okay? We always think that we can stand up for ourselves and fight and be able to do what we need to take care of, and we can, but we're not stronger than God. There's certain situations where we can't carry that, book, that yoke and that burden anymore. 
We have to be able to throw ourselves before the throne of God and get ready to encompass ourselves in his presence for him to take us through that next journey in our life. We think we can do it, and we really can't. And I know that, and this part of the repeat is like Peter talks about, God cares about those type of things for us. He knows that, they're, that, he knows that it's weighing upon us, but it takes a proactive, voluntary move of us to put ourselves in it, to, to throw it out there to God. We, he can't just come and grab it from you. You have to say, God, Jesus, I need you to carry this burden for me because I can't do it. And here at the Place Church, we want to talk about the tough questions all the time. We want to do the difficult things. And that's what it takes for us to be proactive. It takes that humility, knowing that to get to that place of peace is to surrender those type of problems to Jesus. Jesus voluntarily, Dr. Roy preached two weeks ago, Jesus voluntarily left heaven to come here to die for our sins. We should be voluntarily going out of our way to be peacemakers, to make a change, to, be a, to rise up, world, to be a world changer, to do those type of things. It takes that voluntarily surrendering or surrenderness, that's not even a word, but that's what, what the, uh, surrender yourself, to move in that type of pathway so you can be a change maker and you can be a peacemaker. That's what God has called you to do. Whether it's somebody who is in a fight, somebody that you can see is hurting, somebody that is in pain, someone that is in a physical ailment of pain, you are called to be a peacemaker, to speak life into them, to speak life over themselves and speak life over the people around them. That is what the divine power that God has given you through that sword of peace. Peace is not just for us to just enjoy for our worldly self. It's for us to go and share with the world around us. It's for us to share with our neighbor who is hurting with us. A gentleman that I have a a friendship with that I actually get to work with. And for the longest part of his life, he was trying to find peace through the bottom of a bottle, through drugs, through things that have an ailment that would, were not good for him. And it got him to a point in his life where he thought he was going to die and take his own life because his mind was continually running. He was trying to find a peace. He was trying to remove himself from painful situations in the past because he was abused growing up. His family did not care about him. They, they said mean, terrible things to him. They didn't feed him. He did live in poverty. He did have to almost take care of himself and his brothers and sisters. And that, and that drained on him. That burden, that carrying, that weight and that tiresome on himself caused him to do those things, to go find peace somewhere else rather than turning back to God. God was aware of his pain and, his pre and, and where he was in his life. But until he turned, until someone said to him, I know where you'll be able to find that peace. I know where you're going to be able to find that rest. I know why you need to surrender and what you're going to surrender to because you're surrendering to the wrong thing. You're surrendering to your circumstance rather than what God has planned for you in your life. I don't know why, like, John, or when I was praying about this and this message, why God wanted me to talk about Jeremiah 29, 11, and, I, and it's very popular because a lot of in the Christian faith, we know about it, but it talks about who God is and who, what he is capable of doing, what he's doing. And it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. When God declares something, it means when God speaks, it is happening. It is going to happen. It is affirmed. It is not going to mess up. God is not going to make a mistake. He's not going to think about it again. When he says it, it's mine. He's declared, excuse me, <laughs> um, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So what does that have to do with peace and surrender? Well, as humans, like I said, our hearts are very complex and we're fighting a bunch of different things and we're trying to figure out what is the plan and the destiny for our life. And we're trying to do it from a worldly view rather than a godly view. And when we try to do it from a worldly view, all of those things that stir up in our heart remove ourselves from being surrendered, removes ourse removing ourselves from being peaceful people, from being peacemakers. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. To get into a state of like that, to understanding God's plan and purpose for your life is surrendering to the situation that you are, to, uh, surrendering to God's presence in that time of your life when something is terribly going wrong. Like I mentioned before, my family had, had owned those two businesses and they had done extremely well with them and they were gone just like that. Instead of surrendering to God's presence, we were surrendering to the circumstance and we were painful and we were hurting and we were refusing to understand that God's plan is far greater than from what we will ever be able to comprehend and where eventually God is stirring up something inside of you to move into you into a new season of your life. I was between the ages of 10 and 13 years old. And I think that's around the time that 
you start to understand things and comprehend from your, what your parents are going through. And I could see the season that my parents were in. And I could see it through with my brother. And it started to affect our relationships together. And I think it's encouraging to know that God is the type of leader who doesn't leave us, who is, who's looking to see us through a glorious conclusion. God not only stands beside us in these types of situations, but he's in front of us, he's behind us. I know I might step on some people's toes and saying we're with God next to It's like, no, God has already gone through it for you. God has already paid the price for it. It's for us to surrender to him and his power and his glory and his might to understand that what we're going through is the same exact thing that he had gone through for us. That he carried that burden in that weight. He carried that stress and that sin and that foolishness for you and I, the weight of man which is far greater than from what you and I are going through. But he felt it. The, everything that you worry about is what God worries about for you. But he is the only one who controls the situation. When God is the type, God is the type of leader who provides an agenda, but if we're faithful to him and we are obedient to his plan for our life and we surrender to him and his presence, we're so much more stronger on the glorious outcome than we thought of when we came back in because we don't even recognize those type of people. When I was younger, I used to give some sermons to my youth group, and I really liked it, and I didn't know exactly why God was asking me to do stuff like this, and like I said, I was 10, 13 years old, I was just getting ready to go, I was the eighth grade, getting ready to freshman going into high school, and that's around the same time that my family had went through this, and we lost our business, it was my, you know, the first semester of my, senior, my freshman year of high school, and it was a very painful time, but but God, like I said, was stirring up something inside of me at that time. I talked about that community that I was in, stirring up something inside of me, preparing for me for the next season of my life. And so anyway, I, I had preached those sermons a few times, and, and we had ended up moving because we'd lost our house. And I turned away from God because in that painful and hurtful situation, I surrendered to my circumstance rather than to surrender to the presence of God, rather than surrendering to the Holy Spirit from what he had been stirring up inside of me. And not only did it affect the way that I was carrying myself, but it affected the relationships around me. I had mentioned before that my, my brother and I were watching this together growing up, and I think God had a, a unique, we were in the presence of God at those few moments, that together we were submitting to our circumstances rather than each other. I should have been running to my brother rather than fighting with my own brother about this, rather than fighting with what was going on. There's a picture, I, I tried to find it, and it's a rope, and it's tied around someone's hand, or they're grabbing on a rope, and the rope is going one way, and they're pulling the other. And they think by pulling the rope back their way, they're going to get what they need, but when they released it, they'd only damage themselves. That's the easiest way to think about peace and surrender, is that when we keep pulling on those type of things that are going away from us, we damage ourselves. We put ourselves so much far, farther behind than where we could have been today. And so I, I said that because my brother and I, we had fought, 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 and fought. And I'd ran away from home, and I'd hurt my family, hurt my brother, I hurt my family's family, you know, the immediate family around me. And everybody heard that Austin ran away from home. And Austin heard his mother and his father and his brother. And, they only, and really he hurt his brother because he left his brother. And his brother had no one there for him. And for me, I, I didn't know that God's plan at that time was for me to leave the house to go out and figure out that I can't carry all this burden by myself, that I can't think I can overcome these circumstances before me. I just can't. That's, why would not, I can't think that it's not going to be God's plan to deliver me from this type of evil. I had to go back home in the, after those type of situations because I'd get to a point where I would, that burden and the heavy sum was so heavy that I had to surrender to that circumstance. And I did. And when I surrendered to that circumstance, not only did I remove myself from God's presence in my life, but I was almost, I thought that I would almost be unidentifiable to God. But that wasn't the case at all. God had already seen me before. And all I had to do was just reach out and say, God, I surrender to your plan and your purpose for my life. And I got to go home and I, and I you know, reconciled with my brother. And he's, in the last couple of years, my brother has been my best friend. And that's how we have to treat the church. That's how we have to treat with each other, that when we don't run away when it hurts, run towards the pain. Press further into God's presence and plan for your life. I'd watched plenty of people before, or as young as I am, especially in my generation, that when things are hurting and they're painful and you don't know how to comprehend them, we run away from them, we try to block them out. 
We refuse to acknowledge that it exists. We try to refuse to acknowledge that evil exists. And then when evil comes knocking at our door, we're not prepared for it because we're not peacemakers at that time. We're not, we're being, we're being, we're not being proactive in those type of situations. When we see evil happening, when we see the enemy coming towards us, we have to be proactive in those type of situations to use that sort of peace to help and ward off each other, to be like Jesus in that moment and flip those tables and be ready to be the peacemakers. Don't sit back idly by and let your brother and sister hurt and, and, and not understand that God has a plan and purpose and a vision for their life, that knowing that Jesus died on the cross for all their sins to be forgiven so that they can use the rest of their life from a view standpoint of victory rather than from a circumstantial situation. And before we go, I, I just wanted to say that in order to find this type of peace, it doesn't come from running somewhere. It doesn't come from a self-help book. It comes from knowing Jesus. And knowing Jesus is knowing that peace. And before we go today, I'm not going to do anything scary. I'm not going to ask you to do something that you don't feel comfortable with. But since the Lord laid this on my heart, I want to pray for people who are looking for that peace. I want to pray for people that are searching for that surrender, who are willing to surrender their hearts right now to Jesus, willing to make sure that at the end of the day, that when they come through a tough circumstance, when they hit a trial and a tribulation, that they are ready and that they have surrendered and they have that sort of peace and they're ready to ward off the enemy. That they're ready to understand that God's plan and purpose and vision for their life is far greater than from what we can comprehend. That we are here to be peacemakers, that your heart would be changed and be ready for peace to fill it. That when you would go out beside these four walls, that you will be a peacemaker and you will go and change the rest of the world through that peace. And if you want to know that peace today, let's pray. Jesus, we accept your peace. We know that you came not only to this world to give peace, but to be a peacemaker through us. We know, God, that when we go through this time of day and, and, and it's hard and there's struggles and there's pain and heartbreak, it's so much easier to turn away from you rather than it is to turn from you, to have that knee-jerk reaction. But when we understand, when we open up this Bible here and we understand that this is our sword, that when we, we look at this, we can turn so much easier to you and our hearts are being so much more umpired and refereed by you, we understand that you're far greater than any problem and circumstances that we have. Lord, I ask people here today that the, who, who have been searching for peace, God, that they would continue to open their hearts to you that they would lay their situation before your throne today, God, that they would not succumb to their circumstance, but they would succumb to your presence in their life, that that burden and that worrisome that is being carried on their shoulders, God, that they would surrender to you to take that off. You said, cast your yoke upon me, and we are ready to cast it upon you today, God. We can't do it alone. We want to know that peace. And before we go today, I want to give people the opportunity to know that. Jesus loves you and he died on the cross and he wants to give you that peace and he wants to share that peace and he wants you to know that he is there to carry that burden for you. And if you want that burden lifted today, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. And I'm not going to make you do anything, come up here. I'm just going to ask with our eyes closed, if you want to know that peace, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand and we're going to pray with you. On the count of three, one, two, three. Hand, hand, hand. Awesome, awesome, great. We're going to know the peace of Jesus. Say, everybody, if you've said this prayer before, say it again with us. Jesus, I want peace. Come into my heart. Cloak me in your goodness. Fill me inside with your peace and love. I believe you are the Son of God. And you died on the cross for all my sins to be forgiven. Make me a child of God. Make me a peacemaker. I surrender only to you for the rest of my days. And all God's people said, amen. We believe if you prayed that prayer that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we're so thankful, and I appreciate all of you coming here today, and let's go out and be peacemakers. You guys give it up for Austin Smith. Didn't he do a great job?